I am joined by Clara Botto, a passionate advocate for ethical climate intervention and a member of AGU's Early Career Advisory Board. With her dedication to science communication and youth engagement, Clara is helping shape policies that prioritize innovation, inclusion, and impactful solutions for our planet. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. First, how can science have a seat at the table when it comes to policy debates and decisions? I think that in, an, in a both indirect and direct way, scientists have always had a seat at the table because whether policymakers like it or not, um, all the drafts and memos that get to their tables have been informed by scientists before or all the the hard facts um, that are there on their briefs were also informed by scientists before. Um, so I think, first of all, indirectly, scientists have also have always played a huge role. Um, but I think now with the climate crisis more than ever, they they have not only a role, but also responsibility to be part of, of mm -hmm. decision making mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And right now, there's a lot of uncertainty moving forward with the next administration to take office. So what concerns you about this and where are you looking for areas of possible common ground? Mm, it concerns me that actually scientists won't be so respected anymore. Um, we know there's been a huge wave of, of denial when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, when the science is clear, actually, that we are in a crisis that's not only affecting the, the climate, but people and animals and um, lives all around the world. Um, so that's a huge concern that I have, that all of this concrete evidence that we have accumulated for the past decades will just be dismissed when making decisions. Yeah, yeah. And are there ways that you're trying to find ways around this or common ground with moving forward in this next you know, wave of administration? I think international slash global governance plays a huge role in this. Um, because whether the current the new administration like it or not, they're still um, part of a global governance system mm -hmm. where there are rules to follow and procedures to follow. Um, I know they're not binding agreements, but there's still a, a framework and there is a, a common set of, of best practices to be followed. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of science of the future, AI and machine learning seem to be of great discussion recently. So where do you see Earth and space science in this fast moving area of study? I think um, we still don't know what are all the potentials that AI and machine learning have. Um, I guess science is a, is, a, is a fast evolving field and right now we might not know how this field will be looking like in the next say five years. Um, but I think we need more research into understanding how those technologies can be more energy efficient because I do understand it's, it's very easy and convenient to just rely on AI for practices that, that we've been doing manually um, before, but um, we, we shouldn't forget that they're very energy demanding mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we have to be careful about that. So science has always been powered by people, and given your involvement in science communication and policy, why do you think it's so important that we involve youth in the discussions surrounding climate intervention and ways forward with climate change? I think in a very cliche way, um, young people are the future decision makers. Um, I say cliche just because a lot of people have been saying that, but it's, it's true. Um, people who are learning about challenging topics like climate intervention today, they will be making decisions um, in the near future, actually. So the sooner they start understanding what these technologies are um, and what are all the ethical and, um, and scientific challenges around them, um, the better, because then they'll be more informed mm -hmm. in the years to come. Well, Clara, thank you so much for sharing this insight. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs>